If you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke, actually to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, Luke 11, 1 also shares with what we're going to cover, but Matthew is where we're going to head. So Matthew chapter 6, we start a new series today. So today's sermon is entitled, When You Pray. So the sermon series is called, Teach Us to Pray. It's from Luke 11.1, where the disciples asked Jesus um, to teach them to pray. And if you're anything like me, maybe you would admit it. How many of you would admit, and I'll ask you to raise your hand, that you don't pray enough? Would you admit that? All right, so I see a lot of you, those of you who do pray enough, I'd like to talk with you after the service because I want to know your secret. All right, uh, prayer is difficult and it's a challenge. And I think it, it makes us question um, God. It makes us question, is it, is it working? Does it work? Uh, am I saying the right things? Am I doing it the right way? And ultimately, faith require, or prayer requires faith. And so... Um, this journey that we're going to go on in the next seven weeks as we go throughout this series, um, I hope that it'll help you as we as we think about prayer, as we think about not just doing it, but what what does it look like? What does it look like as we go throughout our relationship with God and what He's created us in places here on earth to do, and how we can walk with Him as we're walking this earth? It's a challenge and it's hard. Um, how many of you keep your passwords of all your internet stuff in like a secret book or, or place? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, I know they had those online things that like you a little notebook that you can keep track. I have no idea how to do that. Um, I won't tell you which book, but we have a book in our house because I don't want this broadcast on YouTube. But we have a little book in our house that has all of our passwords in it. And it's just a jumbled mess. Because over the years, my wife is shaking her head, uh, over the years, um, used to be like when things first started 15 years ago, you know, oh, I can, I can pay our credit card online. That's really cool. So you fill that out and you put it in there. Well, then you have to change your password every so often. And then so you scribble that out and you put the new one in. Well, then there's ones like, and I was just using the back of an address book. So I didn't even have a real password book. And so it's just a jumbled mess. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing more frustrating to me that when I sit down to do something that I don't like anyway, paying bills, that when I get on and I try to log on and it tells me that I have the wrong password and I've done it three times and I've even used my little fingerprint that puts the password on automatically and then I go to the little book that we have and it's not the right one, and I try the last five ones, it's just frustrating. Are there any amens out there? Okay. So you understand what I'm talking about. Getting access to what you need when you want it. It's, it's troubling. It's, it's a struggle. It's hard. You know, one of the things that we love, though, is we love going out camping. And where we go camping uh, on the Pennsylvania New York border is we have very little to no cell phone range. So the accessibility to us and our accessibility to other things is really refreshing. It's really nice not to have accessibility in that point to be able to say, okay, I don't I don't need I don't need to 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 have my phone where it beeps at me every 20 seconds on when I get an email or something different. It's nice to have that, but then to go ride my bike up the road for a little bit and to check my, check my messages and see if there's anything there. To still have that accessibility, but have it when I want it. Maybe that's your prayer life. Maybe, maybe you want accessibility to God whenever you want it. Um, we've come so far, right? I, I've, I've written some of our guys who are currently serving uh, in our military. And to be able to write them a letter is, is still great. But they can video chat. Like you can, you can talk to them on the phone. You can do a video so you can actually see them now. 
like used to be you would you would tie a little message to the foot of a pigeon and they would fly and hopefully they would make it there. Do you remember that? Some of you don't. I know Dale does though. Dale remembers that. The accessibility to one another has changed so much. When we look at the opportunity that God gives us, we have access to God every single second of every single day. It's amazing. I don't have to remember a password. I don't have to make sure that I go to the right place so that it lines up, you know, with God. Like, I better go here. Oh, yep, good reception. Got five bars. Okay, God, now that you can hear me. That's why I think when when Jesus is uh, sharing here in Matthew, it's in the series of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's sharing multiple different truths. And part of it here in Matthew records for us is, is his prayer. This is how you pray. This is how I want you to pray. And as he begins, before we even get into the prayer part of how to pray, he says, this is what you need to do or don't do. And he says it this way. Matthew records for us, when you pray. So what does that tell us? It's an assumption. There's an assumption that we are going to be people who pray. Now, Many of you, almost all of you, rose your hand earlier and said, you don't pray enough. I, I, it's hard to preach a series on prayer when you know you don't, pre, when you don't pray enough. And, and it's a challenge. And yet, this is something that we can continue to grow and we can continue to learn. And when we look at our passage this morning, I want to read uh, with you Matthew 6 and verses 5 through 15. And when we look at this, I, I want to give you three things that when we pray, it'll give the foundation for our prayer time, okay? And so if you would, look with me there in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, and we'll look at verses 5 through 15. It says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward, they receive their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's a lot in this. We're just going to take the first couple verses here this morning. When you pray. Did you see it? Did you see where Matthew records for us? Three times. When you pray. Verse 5. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. So what's he saying? Well, he doesn't want us to be hypocritical. Hypocrites of what? Well, Let's back up and let's actually look at the first four, four verses because as Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually using this in the context of what he's already said. So we'll look at verses 1 through 4 now. They should be up there and we'll show you. Are they there? Matthew 6, 1 through 4. There it is. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What Jesus has built upon here is he's first saying, what about giving? When you give, there's again, there's that phrase, when you give. It's an assumption saying that you are going to be givers. Just as God has given to us, we see that we are stewards. That we're not owners of anything that we have. It's all God's. And God has graciously allowed us as stewards to steward what he has entrusted to us. And so we give. And when we give, we give not so that people can see us, as the hypocrites do, because they want to put on a good show. They want this outward appearance that they are doing something fabulous and righteous. Jesus leads in, not just with giving, but then he says about prayer. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't do it publicly, pronouncing in front of everybody. So does that mean that we shouldn't pray publicly? The answer is, are you guys awake? No. That's not saying you shouldn't publicly pray. They prayed all the time, reading the scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament. They're, the, the large groups gathering in prayer. If my people will humble themselves and pray, I will hear their, heal their land. There's a call to prayer all the time throughout the scriptures because it's about a relationship. It's not saying that you can't ever pray publicly. It's getting to the heart and the heart of when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites and make yourself something that you're not. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't make your prayer about somebody seeing or hearing you. Prayer isn't about that. Think about this. In your relationships, you ever been around those people, and maybe it's at a, you know, a, a class reunion or something where you go and you start, uh, you start sharing stories and different things, and then in the midst of those stories, somebody always has one, one up, they got the better story or they know this other person that, you know, is really famous. And their story just seems like their insecurity is so bad that they have to share something better. Ever been around those people? Maybe you are one of those people. That's what it comes to here. Don't, you're not acting like you're like the God's gift to the world on prayer. Don't be like the hypocrites. Hypocrites are opposite. They think they are this, but in reality, they are this, or they're doing this, but really they live this way. Don't live purposefully hypocritical lives, even though all of us are hypocrites in one way. If God's shown me anything through this whole pandemic, it's the fact that we're all hypocrites, every single one of us. Some have trouble admitting it. Others hopefully don't. We're sinners, saved by God's grace. When we mess up, admit it. Don't let your pride get in the way. Don't think that you're something that you're not. So when we pray, don't act like the hypocrites to be seen by others. The second, he goes on, he says this in verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door to your Father who is in secret. So in the secrecy, some people will lead that, them to believe that this is, oh, you can only pray when you're in secret. You need to go to a prayer closet. You need to go to somewhere where you're secluded. I don't think Jesus is, that's his main point here. His main point, he's already made it earlier with the hypocrites. You're not supposed to be making yourself out to be something that you're not. Making it vocal, making yourself look so good. But really your heart is far from God. And he says, listen, go in secret, close the door, and notice what he says there. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your, what does he say? To your father. To your father who is in secret. Pray to your father. You know what this means? We have a personal relationship with Jesus. I love where John writes, writes for us in 1 John. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called the children of God. We are God's children and we have that relationship. 
And that's what Jesus is trying to say. Listen, get alone with your daddy. Get alone with him. Spend time with him. Don't think that you have to do it publicly. You don't have to go to church to be with God. Go in your home. Close the door. Spend time with God. He's your father and he loves you. The third thing we see here is in verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Remember, if you remember back in Acts, Paul was fighting through this, and he went to uh, some churches in Ephesus uh, where they used these long phrases. They were very educated. They wanted to learn. The text told us how much they desired to know more and more. That's why they were inquiring of Paul about his God, because they wanted to know more. And so uh, Jesus is saying here, listen, look at the, look at the Gentiles. Their, their, their desire to know more and to have more information and more wisdom is getting in their way because they're using these empty phrases. Jesus tells us, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. The fact is, is Jesus allowed us the great privilege of interacting with the Father, and we can come to the Father at any point of any day, at any time. We don't have to say a magic word so it, the door opens. Hocus pocus doesn't work, and then all of a sudden it magically appears. You don't say pretty please with sugar on top, and then all of a sudden the Spirit comes and dwells you, and God is so real. No, we had the living God that's inside of us right now. So we don't have to use what I'm going to call Christianese. It's my word of the day. Do not use Christianese. That's a language that's all our own, meaning you don't have to use these phrases of thinking in order to pray, you have to say the right thing. It's not a lock that needs to be unlocked or broken into. Prayer is something that happens because it's a relationship. It's about a relationship that your father knows you. I love that. In verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need. Jesus helps us to see again, it's not this large group, super religion item that you need to check off your list. No, prayer is an opportunity for us to go to God and to hear from God and spend time with our Father who knows us, who loves us, and demonstrates that every single minute of every single day. We have access. Here's a few verses you can write down. I won't take time or have you turn to them, but they're here on the screen. Romans chapter 5, verse 2 says, We have obtained access by faith through Jesus. The reason why we can pray and the reason why we can have the confidence that we have access to the Father is because of Jesus. Because of what we've been talking about through communion and other things this morning. We have access to the Father because through Jesus, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We have access through Jesus, and because of what Jesus has done, we can go to the Father. And so we can be confident that there isn't some, uh, some code or password that we have to remember in order to come to the Father. In fact, Jesus has paid it all. He's done it. We don't have to search for five bars. We have access to the Father right now. Every day, every second that we are here on the face of this earth, we have access to the Father. Why? Because of what Jesus did. That's what makes it so special. Hebrews 4.16 says, With confidence we draw near to the, the throne of grace. So that throne of grace of being able to come to God and to speak with him and to share our heart and to also listen to him in prayer that we have that confidence to come to a holy and righteous God, even when we're sinners, even when we mess up, and even when we fail him miserably, and it's horrible, and it's bad, we can have confidence because of the grace of God and because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And so while we may feel at times ashamed of what we've done, and we should if we're sinners, we have confidence to draw near to God, to be able to come to him, to confess our sin, knowing that he hears us, 
and he loves us, and he wants us to come to him. There's no perfect people. I love Psalm 121, and it's come up a couple times in my devotion this week, and I think it's something God's trying to encourage me with. Psalm 121, verse 4, says that God, the God of Israel, he never sleeps. He never slumbers. So that time that you're like in the depth and you're just really struggling and you're like, well, I'm going to pray and I hope God's listening. Don't buy into that non-truth. Don't buy into that lie. Our God never sleeps. He's always there. In 1 John 5, 14, we have confidence in the Lord and that he hears us. Not only does God not sleep, he also is listening. He hears us. Ever ask yourself why Jesus prayed? Found myself as I was preparing for this series. Asked that question. Came across that question. Why did Jesus pray? He was full of God. He was full of man too. But if he knew everything, then why would he have to pray? He was perfect and holy. I think it comes down to these few things. Jesus was, was reliant upon his father. It was about a relationship that he had with his father. It was about love for us. And it was about obedience. I think this is a series I might do somewhere down the line about obedience and how Jesus was all about the will of the father. Because in John 4, 31, John 5, 30, John 6, 38, 10, 18, 12, 49, and 50, 14, 30, and 31, 15, 10, talks about just Jesus doing the will of the Father. He didn't want to do anything else but the will of the Father. And you know what prayer does? Prayer sits us down with the Father who we can trust, and it gives us access, and it allows us the great and wonderful privilege to say, God, you are creator God. You are holy and righteous and just. There is no impurity in you, and yet I am so bad. I can be so evil. My thoughts, what I do is so contrary to your perfection. I'm not perfect, and I'm not able to come to you, but God, you came to me, and you offer me to come to you now, and I can come to him Every second of every day. So when we pray, we pray not only because Jesus did it. He's a great example, but we learn from him because he's the son. And we're the children. We have awesome access to a perfect and holy God. How are you using that access? Would you say that you are praying? How do we grade ourselves in that prayer? We'll talk more in the weeks to come. But you got to start somewhere. You need to understand that you have access to your creator who wants you to talk to him, who wants you to listen. And so let me encourage you to have small conversations with the father throughout the day. As you go throughout your week this week and even this day, ask God to help you that you would have a mind of prayer, that it would, it would just dawn on you, that it would be more evident to you, that you would be more purposeful too, and realizing that there are times throughout your day that you can pray and just have those small conversations with God. I think that's why Paul says pray without ceasing, because it was a constant communication. Let me also encourage you that maybe you would spend 15 minutes in prayer. Maybe you don't, you've never done that before. Maybe you just start with five. But I want to encourage you, would you spend 15 minutes in prayer this week, every morning? And then before you go to bed, would you spend 10 minutes in prayer? Before you go to bed. The worst was in college. Such good intentions. 
There were times that I even got on my knees at my bed. I'm going to pray tonight. Mm-mm. And before I knew it, half an hour later, my knees were aching and my legs had fallen asleep. And somehow I tried to roll into bed because I'd fallen asleep. There's something about prayer and the challenge of it. But let me encourage you, don't stop, don't give up, don't not do it. Maybe you don't understand it and you don't know how it works. Let me encourage you, you have access to talk with God and to listen to him. Spend time, 15 minutes every morning this week. Put it on your calendar, put it on your phone. Make good intentions. If you miss a day, don't stop. Just pick it back up. Spend 10 minutes every night before you go to bed. We have a time where I get to pray with my son every night. Sometimes he prays. Sometimes I pray. Sometimes we miss a night. Not very often. But we've incorporated that into our habit of how we live our life. Prayer has become part of that ritual of looking at our day and thanking God for it but also asking God to protect and to care for some of the people that we love the most. Spend time praying. You have access to your creator God who loves you and who desperately wants to share himself with you. He's not a big, mean guy who seeks to whip you into shape. He's a loving, gracious, and merciful God whose mercy is new every morning. When you pray, we have to start somewhere. Start today. So let's pray. Would you bow your head and if God has challenged you, the spirit of God has challenged you in this moment and this time, would you, uh, would you ask God to help you? If, if you're committing to that 15 minutes in every morning and 10 minutes at night, ask God for help. Maybe it's something else that God is leading you to do and challenging you in your prayer walk. Lord, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you that you have given us access to your throne of grace. Sometimes it's hard to believe that we even have that. Sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around the idea that when we start praying that we're, we're actually talking to the God of the universe who hears us and knows us, who loves us and wants our very best. Sometimes it's been hard, Lord, because we feel like our prayers aren't getting answered. Because life doesn't go the way that we think it should. And yet, Lord, every day you continue to be faithful and you're continually there for us. And so I pray that as a congregation, as a church here at West Hill, that through, especially through these next seven weeks, Lord, that you would help us to build some habits that would help us, that would help us to continue in our relationship with you. That it wouldn't be about looking good in front of a group of people. It wouldn't be about us boasting of, of how, how religious or the things, the good things that are happening but, Lord, it would be about you. It would be about our walk and our relationship with you and what you're doing in us and through us. And whether that's through great joys and happiness and celebrations or whether that's through sorrow and hardships and difficulties, through pain, through trauma, Lord, may we be people who continue to pray. Help us. Help us to pray.
Thank you for hearing and answering us, Lord. We're going to trust that your spirit's going to guide us and direct us. Help us to be obedient then. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.